bet the board. What do you mean you don't bet? I mean, I don't bet. You know, I don't care. I don't. Wizard. I never have and I never will. Yeah, right. I'll bet you 20 bucks I can get you gambling before the end of the day. You owe me 15 grand, pal. Pay him. Pay that man his money. It's the Bet the Board podcast. God likes me. He really, really likes me. In the end, I wound up right back where I started. I could still pick winners, and I could still make money for all kinds of people back home. And why mess up a good thing? Here's Payne Insider and Todd Furman. Welcome in to the Bet the Board podcast, NFL Week 2, a Monday Night Football edition. We'll keep sharp objects and bridges away from a couple of prominent fan bases, some teams we didn't anticipate being 0-2, and a couple of surprise stories thus far. We will get to those as we always do on the Monday show. I'm your host, Todd Furman, joined as always, or I shouldn't say as always, for the second straight episode, a man you can follow on Twitter, at Watt underscore 05. And, and Billy, we know Payne is still attending to some family manners. He'll be back in the fold for college on Wednesday. You acquitted yourself quite nicely on Thursday, so we figured we'd put you back in the hot seat for this show here Monday morning. Love it. Love it, man. Now, I got to say, the amount of work that goes into doing these podcasts, I am not sure how you guys do this uh, on the weekly basis you do, but it was good to get a peek behind the curtain and help you guys out yeah doing three shows a week in the nfl uh, and trying to divide and conquer for a lot of that stuff uh, gets to be a little bit challenging and obviously frustrating no doubt for some of our most loyal listeners the steelers failed to get there for our best bet week one the cincinnati Bengals not much better in week two but we continue to persevere as always and hopefully we'll find some interesting angles that listeners can attack with not one uh, but a tandem of games that they can dive into for monday night football week two as we always do on a monday Monday morning, we kick things off with the good, the bad, and the ugly. But before we get there, want to relive what we saw unfold on Sunday Night Football first and foremost. And when we look at the way that game was bet, we saw... Money come in on the road favorite, getting up to three earlier in the week. On game day, it was one-way traffic. New England closed at some of the sharpest shops as just a one-point home underdog. The offensive line didn't have all of its cogs, but a little bit healthier. Miami ruling out Taron Armstead and Jalen Phillips. But it was the Dolphins' offense, Billy, that the Patriots had a hard time matching score for score despite some late-game heroics and Cole Strange's inability to pick up an extra half a yard. Yeah, and I think that's the great point, uh, a place to start for this one is we saw Belichick kind of come out in this three safety look. He had everything deep. He was daring Miami just to take the short, easy throw. But that's exactly what McDaniel and Tua did. They took everything. They took everything across the field. Mostert. They started getting that run game going, and eventually they broke. The dam broke, and we saw Waddle have some explosives. Mostert with the big run in the second half. And New England just could not do enough on the offensive end to keep up. And eventually, even though they had a shot at the end of the game, it just wasn't enough. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Raheem Mostert. He ends up with about 60% of the carries for the Dolphins. It's rare that we see a true bell cow back emerge, but that 43-yard touchdown run, kind of the straw that broke the camel's back, or at least we thought uh, at the time it happened. And you mentioned New England and the defensive posture they took in the game. According to NFL Next Gen Stats, New England had five or more defensive backs on the field for 32 of its 61 snaps, 17 which featured six DBs. Christian Gonzalez with the impact play, Tyreek Hill, positive things to say about the talented rookie out of Oregon and the impact he made there but this was a New England defense that didn't appear poised to create havoc to take advantage of short fields to get after Tua with his quick release Uh, and more importantly I think something that we talked about before we jumped on New England lacks some of that big play potential and it's so difficult in this day and age even if you're efficient down to down if you can't pick up chunk yards going to be extremely an uphill battle to try and knock off some of the better teams in the league. Well, yeah, and you guys talked about this in the offseason pod is who's the explosive receiver here? Devontae how, Parker's How your, dare your you talk poorly, poorly past <laughs> dispersions at Devontae Parker? Yeah, I mean, Devontae Parker's your jump ball guy, and granted, Mac Jones' throw to him that Xavier Howard eventually intercepted was a little short, but you got Devontae Parker out there. Juju is... I don't, I'm not sure what his role is going to be moving forward, but he's a he's a 
forgotten part of this offense. You got Demario Pop Douglas, who's got the speed, the explosiveness. Of course, he fumbles in that game, sitting on the sideline, holding the football like, remember the Titans. Uh, <laughs> that was interesting, uh, you know, professional football. I like it. I do like it. But, yeah, Hunter Henry and Mike Kosicki, coming into the season, you thought this was a really nice, two nice pass-catching tandems, which Hunter Henry is. But you're right, where, where are they stretching the, stretching the field? There's just no just outstanding speed that can really stretch it. So there's no threat and teams can kind of get after Mac. Hey, I mean, look, holding the football on the sidelines did work for Darnell Jefferson as well, way back in the (laughs) the program. Omar Epps, one of his finer movie roles. So Mm -hmm. maybe it'll work there. But you mentioned the fumble there. I mean, it was New England self-inflicted as much as anything else. The defense gave them a chance, but when you have a turnover, an interception inside the five-yard line, very nice play from Xavier Howard. You have short on downs, uh, obviously, on the final drive of the game uh, and in the green zone with the fumble. It's tough to beat good teams. But New England now in uphill battles, they start the season 0-2 0-2 uh, after being at home. Meanwhile, the Miami Dolphins moved to 2-0. And that schedule, if anyone's looked at it in the month of December, extremely favorable. So credit the Finns for getting two hard-fought road victories and sitting undefeated atop the AFC East. All right, Billy, let's get into the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm going to give you the honors to highlight some of the good that you saw. I'll fill in the gaps as needed. Uh, but kick things off to get us going this week in a positive mindset. Yeah, I got two. And I'm going to start with the Seattle offense because – what we saw in week one, specifically in the second half, was just a lot of struggles from Geno. And I think there was a big question on, is this the, are we going to see the Geno from three and four years ago? Or are we going to see the Geno from the past year where he had a great season? You know, he was playing without his starting tackles. So he had backup tackles in there, Stone Forsyth and Jay Curhan, who played phenomenal. Neither guy had any penalties. There were no QB hits, no sacks allowed. But Gino threw for 328, 32 of 41. He finished second in completion percentage over expectation. And he really spread the ball out. Metcalf, Lockett, uh, Jackson Smith and Jigba, and all three of their starting tight ends, Noah Fant, Colby Parkinson, and Will Disley, had over 30 yards. So from that perspective, I thought Gino was phenomenal. Look, I mean, it was a Seahawks team that I was definitely nervous about after watching them week one struggle to move the football in the entire second half against the Rams. To your point, they bounced back. And maybe it was Detroit coming back to earth a little bit with a defensive performance. Seattle did their best to blow a double-digit lead late in that contest. Uh, But to your point, I mean, Geno marches them right down the field after they took the opening kickoff in overtime. And Seattle, a very favorable matchup coming up this week as they'll draw the Carolina Panthers traveling across the country on a short week. So uh, a silver Silver lining there for Seahawks fans. For me, when I look at a game, um, we had the opposite side. Look, laid the points with Denver, feeling real good about the way things were trending with a 21-3 lead. Russell Wilson with a turn-back-the-clock type performance. The deep ball was on point, and it seemed that Sean Payton and company were in their bag. But look, all's well that ends well, and that sure as shit didn't end well for the Denver Broncos. It was the Commanders erasing an 18-point deficit and getting a big road win. For me, Billy, Sam Howell looked the part leading the enemy's offense as they never panicked facing that deficit. They got 10 different receivers involved in the offense. We know what Terry McLaurin and Jahan Dotson can do, but Dotson was a little bit of an afterthought. Brian Robinson looked sharp both running the football uh, and also in the screen game. So full credit to the Commanders, a team that we bet on under their win total, a team that we talked about uh, on the preview podcast, not being able to live up to some expectations. And here they are, 2-0, and albeit not beating NFL heavyweights. But when you have a young quarterback, you start to build confidence. We'll obviously get a much better indication of exactly where Washington is as a team uh, when they host the Buffalo Bills this weekend. Yeah, and you know, they were only 3-for-10 on third down, but how about that be enemy offense, man? 3-for-3 three three in the red zone. I love the screen game with the running backs. It did seem like Denver obviously over-pursued far too much. And, you know, that's a topic for another day with that Denver defense, what's going on there. But really great showing from Sam Howell. And, yeah, I'm with you on the under six and a half. It's not looking too good right now. Yeah, we need a little bit of work, uh, a little bit of work to try and get that thing back on track for the Commanders, but a nice start there for the season. Oh, don't worry, we'll we'll get to the Broncos a, a little bit later in this particular segment, but uh, what was the other thing that stood out to you in the positive manner, and then I'll do my best to highlight a couple individual performances. The Kansas City defense. You know, I, and I spoke to Payne about this earlier in the season, but I was worried they'd have a slow start to the season. I really did not like 
the quotes I was hearing from Steve Spagnola just about how much time it takes to adjust uh, for the young guys, and he could see a slow start. But I really should have listened more to Justin Reed, the safety, who spoke during the preseason about how much more comfortable guys felt in the scheme, specifically in the secondary. They held Doug Peterson to his second lowest output of points since taking over with the Jags with only nine points. They got four sacks, held Trevor to 4.3 yards per pass, held the Jags to three for 12 on third down, 0 for 2 on fourth down, which there's a little more variance there. Overall, a really good showing. And, you know, as a Bills fan, it's just extremely frustrating because Kansas City now gets time to figure out this offense, which (laughs) they will inevitably do, right? Reed Mahomes will inevitably figure it out. And they get to do that because now the defense appears to be playing and likely will continue to play like a top 8 to 10 level unit and that's just not good for the AFC this was the year I was a little more down on Kansas City and sure shit here we go again this this team's this team's primed and it's on the defensive side of the ball which is really impressive to me if anybody wanted to eulogize Kansas City in the wake of their week one loss on opening night against the Detroit Lions I think they've squashed a lot of those notions Uh, and when you look ahead to what Kansas City will face this Sunday the ultimate get right game against the Chicago Bears and an extremely banged up secondary so reason for optimism and until further notice the road to the AFC championship still runs through Arrowhead Stadium individual performances for me three of them stood out and we can go all the way back to Thursday night where it was Kirk Cousins that did everything he could to put that Vikings team on his back uh, including you know the late score in the first half they should have had if Jefferson doesn't file fumble the ball over the pylon I mean the Vikings may have lost that game albeit covering sneaking in through the back door but Cousins finishes 31 for 44 four touchdowns it was under duress pretty much from the opening kickoff behind a makeshift offensive line liked what I saw quite a bit we'll see if he's able to follow that up this weekend against the Chargers. Bijan Robinson, uh, as if his opening act wasn't good enough, he was even better in helping the Falcons spur a double-digit comeback at home against the Green Bay Packers. 56 rush yards rushing and 27 yards receiving in his NFL debut. Well, what does he do for an encore? 19 carries for 124 yards, four catches for 48 yards, and looking every bit the explosive weapon that the Falcons anticipated when they used the top 10 pick there. And then, of course, everyone's favorite fantasy waiver wire pickup coming into the week for those that thought he was a flash in the pan Puka Nakua proved otherwise and continues to be a focal point of this Rams offense while Cooper Cup sits on IR a catch machine filling in perfectly 15 catches for 147 in his second ever NFL game the fifth round pick broke the NFL single game record for receptions by a rookie and he set a new overall league mark with 25 catches in the first two games of his career while the Rams racked up 386 total yards so Puka Nakua even in a losing effort, appears to be that safety valve that Matthew Stafford is looking for early on in the season. Yeah, really cool to see out of him. And that Rams offense, not looking too shabby right now. Um, Another win win total that I'm not exactly (laughs) enamored with right now as we sit here after two data points. Oh, don't worry. They can play uh, Cincinnati without Joe Burrow next week or (laughs) hobble Joe Burrow. So we get to look forward to that as well. Yeah, more on that in a minute. But uh, with the good comes the bad. And uh, again, I'll let you lead this particular portion of the program. Yeah, I kind of led right there. And it's Cincinnati. Um, And if the easy pot shot is to just go after Joe, Joe Burrow, and he's got the new contract. Offense seems in a funk. He only had, had under 40 yards at halftime. Where's Jamar Chase? You know, there was a play in the fourth quarter. I think they were driving to get actually to get us over that two and a half touchdown number but he had a three yard out in the end zone and the the replay he's just jogging through his route I mean you're down 10 we're under five minutes and there's just no fire or pop on that side of the ball and obviously the offense is concerning but I don't know what the plan was on defense they look like they didn't even factor in that Lamar Jackson could run the football on scrambles and Baltimore got whatever they wanted to they got it consistently they just went right down the field nine for 14 on third downs we've seen Cincinnati start slow in previous seasons I don't want to overreact here and say this feels different but with the burrow calf injury things just seem like they're starting a little too slow and this is not the year or the division you want to be doing that in with the way Baltimore and Cleveland look right now. 
Not at all. I mean, no margin for error whatsoever. Uh, your point is well documented uh, on Lamar Jackson. Cincinnati, for as poorly as they played, still had chances to get off the field on third down. And one of the final drives, they allow Lamar Jackson to break contain. He obviously extends the play, and the rest is history there. The Bengals didn't record a first down until more than 10 minutes into the second quarter. That, of course, on the heels of that lackluster effort we saw week one against the Cleveland Browns. And look, that came out of defensive pass interference penalty the first touchdown they had was a impressive punt return from charlie jones overall not a great effort and like you said when you have your starting quarterback dinged up even with one, an extra day before you host the rams on monday night football not the recipe for success Well, I want to give the commanders credit. Look, I'm going to take shots at the Broncos and halftime adjustments. It's now two weeks in a row as more than a field goal favorite. The Broncos completely imploded in the second half. They built that 21-3 lead and looked to be firing on all cylinders. Then they get an extra, you know, uh, extra lifeline with that Hail Mary for Russell Wilson. We can talk about the pass interference, but, you know, it wasn't called. Look, the Broncos didn't deserve to win that game or even send it to overtime. But Kareem Jackson, for the second straight week, undisciplined in the backfield. I get wanting to impose your will physically. You have to do it in the confines of the rules. Otherwise, you pay the penalty. And look, this is now a Broncos team that's lost nine straight games in which they led at halftime. That's the longest such streak in the NFL. So we can blame Nathaniel Hackett. We can blame Sean Payton, but there's something fundamental wrong when you watch that team that the moment they hit even a shred of adversity they fold like a cheap tent tough tough for us denver uh lane three backers tough tough for us denver survivor backers i don't know if you meant you know the cream jackson stuff with the with the hit it just feels like something is wrong again in denver and for different reasons than it was with nathaniel hackett Like you said, Russ is missing throws, but that Denver defense, I mean, the talent they have in that back end secondary to let a guy like Sam Howell just torch them in the second half was, it was concerning and it doesn't, it it feels like it's going to be concerning the rest of the season. They're just, like you said, there seems to be something wrong there. Then, like we talked about, the Broncos already catching money for their trip across the country to take on the <laughs> of Dolphins. Course, of course. Uh, on yeah. Sunday, the Sevens clearing out of the market. Stop me if you've heard this story before. Uh, and one final thing for me in, in the bad department, uh, it'll be the New York Giants. And I know a lot of people out there scratching their heads going, wait, the Giants, well, how are they getting there? I mean, they erased a 21-point deficit. But the bottom line for me, Billy... The Giants should never have been down 21 points to the Arizona Cardinal in any capacity. I mean, defensively, there were been no answers early on stopping the run. It was a turn-back-the-clock type performance from James Conner. I mean, the Giants had given up 60 points before Jones ran a touchdown in for the team's first points of the season. It was actually the third most points given up before scoring since 1950, according to Sport Radar. And while it was the biggest comeback for the Giants since a 21-point rally in a game you and I remember all too well back in 1949, (laughs) against the then St. Louis or Chicago Cardinals. I didn't even check. Uh, Still a lot of problems in River City for the Giants. Offensive line of concern, focus, intensity defensively. They got the win, but a short week they'll have their hands full and most likely going to have to do it without their bell cow back in Saquon Barkley on Thursday night. What do you think about the old rumors that Dayball took over play calling at halftime? He's denying them, but there's some clips circulating on old X that shows that he... He's got that headset on. He seems to be very involved. Um, But the defense is the better point, and that's why I think they they showed up in your bad category is we know Wink's very aggressive, and he sends the blitz, and he takes chances, but you're going up against Josh Dobbs and this this Cardinal offense, which lacks a lot of talent. I do like some of the weapons they have. I like the Michael Wilson kid. I like Rondell Moore, but... When you're just sending blitzes and they're calling draws and handoffs to James Conner, there's no one back there. You guys talked about it in the offseason about Wink's defense, and it, it might be going out of style. It just seemed seems like there's some issues there as well, even though they do have some talent on that defensive line. It's just I think the scheme's a problem. Look, they're going to have to do something, and no one really anticipated that this Giants team was going to put together a miraculous season like they did last year, but I didn't expect them to be this porous defensively. Now, ultimately, they do get the win, and that's what matters most to these teams. Don't come anywhere close to covering that closing number as a a four-and-a-half-point favorite, but life goes on. We'll see what kind of adjustments the Giants make. We are not going to use Thursday night against the 49ers on the road as a measuring stick uh, for Big Blue. Anything else bad that you wanted 
to highlight before we get into the always fun, ugly categorization? Uh, I did have a little note, just, and it, this isn't a big point, but I mean, Brandon Staley's got to be concerned. They, they just can't win these football games. His defense continues to give up the big play. And at some point, you know, I think Chargers ownership is going to going to be thinking about a change if this continues because it's it is fun and exciting football but you have to end up winning football games that's the point of the game and so that that showed up in my bad was just the fact they just can't close i mean incredible when you watch that sequence at Leighton regulation, they have a chance not only to kick the game-tying field goal, but to go in for the game-winning touchdown, and they look completely out of sorts. And their opening drive after winning the coin toss in overtime might have been the worst thing I'd seen all day from a team that had given, been given a new lease on life. Justin Herbert throws three passes. I'm not sure who they were intended for because there wasn't a Chargers receiver anywhere in the area. And then, of course, the defense can't do its part to at least get the ball back for the offense. And here the Chargers are now, staring down the barrel of an 0-2 start heading on the road against a desperate Vikings team on Sunday, uh, where one of those teams is going to find themselves with at, with an 0-3 record just three weeks into the season. Uh, into the ugly category we'll go. And you know what? I'll start here, and then I'll let you close the book before we move further. Uh, I'm going to go right after Chiefs free agent acquisition, Jawan Taylor, who spent the first four years of his career with the Jacksonville Jaguars and had a very rough homecoming, to say the least. Billy, Taylor was penalized five times and ultimately benched for a series, was flagged twice for false starts, which we knew Doug Peterson had brought up to the officials going in, uh, given everything highlighted in that season opener against the Lions, once for an illegal formation and twice for holding. I know it's an adjustment when you're learning a new blocking scheme, uh, but clearly not the homecoming that Jawan Taylor wanted, even if the Chiefs were able to escape with a 17-9 win. No, and you know we talked about it on Thursday, the potential for kind of the reunion matchup with Josh Allen and Trayvon Walker and and that team knowing Juwan terrible outing I wouldn't be overly concerned though I, I do think it looked rough but sometimes it's the homecoming game guys guys want to do everything they want to do a little bit more and they end up just hurting themselves and yeah we saw that against against the Jaguars when you're getting benched as the uh, offseason acquisition that was highly regarded that's not a good sign not in the least. Uh, and final word to you, ugly things that you saw thus far through 15 games a week two. This one's easy. And <laughs> I, uh, I'm i glad I'm doing it and I'm not you because I know you're from this area. But this Chicago offense and Chicago as a team, <laughs> it's just I, I think we have our answer now. I think it's definitive. And I don't even think Bears fans are going to be defending it anymore on what Justin Fields is. You know, they have that opening drive of 75 yards. The next six drives generated just 62 net yards. He was sacked six times. And, and mo- you know, I don't want to say most of them were his fault, but the videos that are that we're seeing on X right now of him just five seconds in the pocket and then running directly into the pressure is, is brutal. He also took a little shot in his in his post-game presser at his offensive coordinator for his interception at the end there. And he said, you know, Luke Getze kind of went with his gut with the call, and it's not an easy job to be an offensive coordinator. But he was missing a bunch of throws. He has his moments. That's the thing is Justin Fields has elite moments where he looks like he's the guy. But there's just zero consistency, and he's got way more of the bad moments. Now potentially they're not going to have Darnell Mooney. We'll see his injury status moving into the Kansas City game. Eberflus is in some trouble there. Yeah, there's so many different ways you can point your fingers uh, at the Chicago Bears. You can blame the offense. You can blame the defense. You can blame the quarterback. To your point, it feels like they're going to need a hard restart. And you know what? Starting off 0-2, knowing what the top of the draft class could be if you have the opportunity to grab a, another quarterback you know, with the top overall pick or somewhere close to it, a very interesting dynamic. But we'll see if things get better for the Bears. Don't quite anticipate that on paper as they will be one of the biggest underdogs on the betting 
board for week three. All that optimism about this Bears team bouncing back. Suddenly, they've given up 25 points in seemingly every single game uh, with a defensive-minded head coach and don't appear to be trending in the right way on the offensive side. You can follow Billy on X. That's at Watt underscore 05. I'm Todd Furman. You can follow me there. Follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. And again, I remind all of you, our loyal listeners, while the best bet didn't get home on Sunday, the best bet in our newsletter got their sweat free. Travis Kelsey under 79 and a half receiving yards. It's an additional prop bet right to you every Friday. It's absolutely free. Sign up for that newsletter. You'll have it for an additional piece of information to try and make your wagering that much more profitable each weekend throughout the fall. Uh, As we always do here on a Monday as well, time to look at some of the look-ahead lines. And quite frankly, there weren't a lot of overreactions in the betting market. I mean, two of the games that we had talked about going into week two, we saw Tampa take money. That one went from pick to minus two and a half. Even the overreaction uh, wasn't able to get folks to grab the Bears at the top of the market to the window. But you did see a little bit of value created in the Seahawks. They went into Detroit and won outright. When you look at the Chargers and Vikings. We haven't moved through a key number here, but the Chargers are two-point favorite on the look-ahead number. We're now seeing the Vikings a one-point chalk, but the total has also moved, and I know that's caught your eye. Yeah, we've seen nothing but over money showing up, and, you know, bet Chris, a very reputable offshore book, got as high as 53 with the underjuiced at minus 120 before there was a little bit of take back. Both teams have literally vocalized numerous times in the offseason and even during the season that they want to play exciting, high-scoring football games. We saw Herbert finally push the ball down the field. He had 10.6 air yards per attempt. I think both offenses are going to have their chance to really put some points up here, and I don't think that total, I don't think we're going to see a flat 51 again. I think it's going up from here. Wouldn't surprise me to see this close, 53 or higher, by kickoff. Not a lot of movement elsewhere on the board, but uh, a week from today, we'll again have a pair of Monday night football games. The Eagles and Bucks a lot more fascinating on paper than it appeared when the schedule was released early on in the season, a pair of 2-0 and teams. But that's not the game that's attracting attention in the betting market early on this morning. It's actually with the Cincinnati Bengals, who were a 7.5-point favorite. We see them, of course, drop their second straight game to the Baltimore Ravens. Market reopened 6.5. Uh, And that's where speculation started to swirl about the status of Joe Burrow. We are now looking at a three and a half painted across the betting board. Yeah, brutal. And, you know, the Rams offense continues to impress even in the loss. Um, Cincinnati, this this could be a game, though, where we see if Joe Burrow gets ruled in, obviously this number is going to go back up. It's down to down to three and a half right now. But. You got two teams who, despite the Rams being one and one and taking that loss, seem to be going in different directions right now. Could be a great buy low spot on Cincinnati if Burrow's in and healthy, but it doesn't seem like that's going to be the case. So this is one we're just going to have to continue to monitor his injury and take this thing day by day. The nice part about injuries is that you and I don't have to speculate. We call on the experts and some of the heavy lifters to try and share their perspective. And he joins us every single Monday here on the Bet the Board podcast. You can follow the great Dr. Deepak on Twitter at SportMDAnalysis. And buckle in fantasy owners because he shares perspective on a lot of difference makers that probably won't be in your lineup as early as this weekend. Are you injured or are you hurt? <laughs> When injuries occur in the NFL, you need someone to call on. If you hurt, you can still play. If you're injured, you can't. Let's check in with Dr. Deepak Chona, Stanford and Harvard trained orthopedic sports surgeon and founder of Sports Med Analytics, the industry leader in data driven injury analysis. So, are you hurt? Or are you injured? All right. Thank you, Todd and Payne. Now, we had a lot of injuries go down, so we'll get right to it, starting with the biggest one, Saquon Barkley. Now, the video suggested that this was going to be a high ankle mechanism, and his reaction plus the amount of force that went into the injury itself really suggested a severe version of this. We have heard some surprisingly optimistic comments come out from the Giants. And specifically, what we do know is that there's no broken bone. There's no fracture on the x-rays there. He's getting an MRI today, and they're hopeful that this is actually a low ankle. If that is, in fact, the case, it's really best-case scenario. 
an average low ankle takes about zero to one week. So you would think that this is probably still on the more severe side of those. So you're probably still looking at uh, about one to two weeks average here. But the key is that low ankle sprains don't tend to drop performance as much as high ankles. High ankles average, especially severe ones, average about four weeks. You do often look at about a 20% performance hit even after the player returns for another four weeks. And in that case, you would think that the IR, maybe even a tightrope surgery would be in play. So we will know a lot more pending the MRI today but they're hopeful that it's a low ankle sprain. And in that case, I would, I would think he'd be out probably one to two weeks. And then we have Joe Burrow, a little less optimism here. The calf strain that he had training camp had six weeks to recover. And then it went fine for about two to three weeks afterwards. But then we saw him re-aggravate it yesterday. And now the key is not can he play week three, the reality is he can very likely play through this. The question is, how much risk are you willing to take? His risk of further aggravating this and probably putting him out for a good four to six weeks is about 20%. And that risk is going to go down with time. So if you rest Joe Burrow about two to three weeks, you get his risk down in that 10 to 15% range. So it's still fairly high, but not as high as it would be if he plays week three. With the Bengals 0-2, it's again, it's really a judgment call. We He can likely play, but it's we're going to see a lot more from how he practices and how it feels over the course of this week. Then we have the Anthony Richardson. This one's a little more straightforward. Concussion protocol. At this point, we know from modern protocols that it's about a 40% chance that a player clears protocol in time for the following game. And you would expect a low performance impact upon return. The key with Anthony Richardson is that his playing style as a physical running quarterback is a very high injury risk and is going to remain so for the rest of the season. And then we have David Montgomery. Now, this one's a little bit interesting. The video was very concerning for a knee injury, specifically a ligament or a meniscus. But the comments from Dan Campbell and from Montgomery suggested that this is a thigh bruise or a thigh contusion. And actually, typical thigh contusions don't cause missed time. David Montgomery would, data would favor him playing week three with a low stats impact. But he's already come out and said that it's this could take a couple weeks. So most likely, it seems like he will miss week three and come back week four. Then we have Devontae Adams. The concussion evaluation was underway when the game was ending. Not a confirmed diagnosis here. The way the, the hit occurred, especially the fact that one, it was helmet to helmet, big force, and two, that it came in from an angle. So it caused a heavy rotational impact to Devante's head. That specifically, the rotational aspect of this is a high risk for a concussion. So we don't know the diagnosis for sure, but if he is in fact concussed, again, 60% of the time he would miss one week and then come back the following. And then we have Odell Beckham Jr. Unfortunately, after a whole lot of injuries, has now gotten one more. But this one is, by John Harbaugh's comments, we think is going to be relatively mild. And it suggests the comments suggest that he had a likely negative x-ray. So probably dealing with a low ankle sprain. Most often in these cases, he would return week three without any performance hit. And then we have Amari Cooper. Now, Cooper was added to the injury report with a groin strain on Saturday. Only two days between his injury, adding his injury to the report and the, his game really makes a lot of sense for him to rest. The key is severity, and we don't have a lot of information here other than that. The comments suggest it's on the milder side. So typically this would take about a week. So he has a good chance pending his practice progress this coming week to play week three. The key though is re-injury risk and that's gonna be somewhere in that 10 to 15% range for Amari Cooper over the next four weeks. And next, Amon Ross St. Brown. Now he had a multiple evaluations on the sideline and the initial report with that was that it was just cramps, which is really the best case scenario. There would be no real performance impact and no re-injury risk expected from that going forward. 
but now we're finding out that they actually taped up his shoe and they put a plate under his toe in his shoe and that very strongly suggests turf toe turf toe is as we know from terry mclaurin it's it usually a multi-week absence and depends on severity sometimes players play through it but if they do it's usually a four to six week performance hit as well the key with turf toe is that for a wide receiver breaking in and out of cuts that's where the toe explosion is important and with Ramon Ross St. Brown's game we we do think this is going to drop his performance probably significantly but depends a little bit on the severity and so we'll know a lot by when he returns to practice then we have Garrett Wilson optimism here for coach Sala no concern just had the wind knocked out of him and he left for an evaluation before the game ended but the, the score was in hand and we don't expect any change in his week three status as a result next Terry McLaurin now he's recovering from the turf toe and you see actually especially on the play where he jumped above two Broncos defenders to catch a touchdown you look like his explosiveness is improving and that's about what we would expect from the data data on turf toe for him suggests he should be 100 percent around week three week four and so terry mclaurin we have rising optimism on and then christian watson now he did return to practice on friday in a limited fashion so his progression data suggests that he has about a 60 percent chance of playing week three that of course the algorithm gets more more accurate as we add in next week's practice data so we will keep be monitoring this one and uh, most likely though he will return week three next aaron jones now we have less information on this one the average mild hamstring takes about two weeks which would be where jones is for week week three and we don't know a whole lot of objective data about his hamstring other than what he told us which is that it was mild so again based on that alone we would think he has a good chance for week three but this one will also be determined by his practice progression data we suspect he'll get in some limited practice sessions this week and he will be a game time decision for week three and then austin eckler this one's a little bit less optimism he his comments suggested that he had a high ankle sprain he was pretty swollen after the game he said and this averages two to three weeks for a running back if it is in fact a mild case as the comments also suggested so the most likely return in the data would be week four but he has a chance for week three pending practice next deontay johnson now this from video last week looked like a at least moderate severity hamstring strain and those average about three to four weeks so you would think that deontay johnson is probably out this coming week probably returning week four or week five the key though is that when he does come back he'll probably have about a 10 percent 10 to 15 percent performance hit but the key is really re-injury risk and in some cases if you rush back that can be as high as about 20 percent so i would if i'm a deontay johnson fantasy owner i'd rather see him back week five and and rest week three week four but we'll remain to be seen how aggressive they decide to be with the management next jacoby myers now he had that concussion after scoring a couple touchdowns last week and he ended up following the typical pattern for a concussion protocol so most cases about three-fourths of the time he would return week three then Chase Edmonds, now that Buccaneers three-headed running back monster is likely to be cut down to two for a little while. And the reason is that Chase Edmonds was ruled out fairly quickly, suggesting that this is a pretty real or serious injury. We don't have a lot of info on when it occurred exactly and, and the mechanism or severity, but just based on that inf information alone, the average on these is gonna be two to four weeks next darnell mooney now he had a questionable tag and he was jogging on the sideline and listed with an ankle that combination suggests that this was a low ankle sprain and most commonly players would return week three without any noticeable performance dip and last but definitely not least aaron Rodgers. now obviously he tore his achilles he's going to be out for a while the question is how long 
And we got some reports from Aaron Rodgers on the Pat McAfee show that he is aiming for a January return. And is that possible? It would be four months from his surgery date. But if you look at the way this surgery sort of occurs and and the demands of the quarterback position, it's important to note that this specifically is not Aaron Rodgers' plant leg. So if this were his plant leg, that's where he's really driving off using the Achilles tendon to create some force in his throws. And because it's not that, you would think that his demands are going to be less. He will have less mobility, and he may be a little bit more prone to getting sacked. But can he return at four months? The minimum biological healing on this is going to be three months. And if you look at the the comments that they used an internal brace, which is basically a support for while the tendon is healing so that he can accelerate his rehab in the early phase, yeah, I do think it's realistic that Aaron Rodgers could return as some form of himself at about four months. But is some form of Aaron Rodgers better than any form of Zach Wilson? Yes, also probably. So I, I think it's not unreasonable for Aaron Rodgers to aim for that. And that's all I got for now. So I will turn it back over. Well, Billy, I mean, Deepak echoed your sentiment talking about Joe Burrow, that even if he is able to go when you tweak a calf injury, the uh, percentage of re-injury gets ratcheted up exponentially in this spot. So I'm going to be fascinating to see where this number goes, because even if Burrow is out there and he's operating in a 60 to 65 percent capacity, I mean, you highlighted some of the lackluster effort we saw elsewhere from the Bengals. It'll be fascinating if this number does actually get back to a flat six uh, or if oddsmakers go, you know what, we're going to move this thing from three and a half through a secondary key number four we'll put it in no man's land at five and then see where some of the sharpest betting minds take that price closer to kickoff yeah and he's fortunate he's not facing an elite defensive line still got to deal deal with Aaron Donald obviously but it might be a matchup where it's not going to be that impactful that he doesn't he's not able to move in the pocket but again if he can barely move and these wide receivers are while very talented, just seem to be going through the motions. It who knows, man? Who knows? This could be a this could be another uphill battle for Cincinnati. I mean, you've invested a small fortune with the rich contract that you've given Joe Burrow. You don't ever want to say you can really err on the side of caution knowing that you're 0-2, but at the same time, you put him out there in harm's way and this thing gets worse. It officially becomes a lost season. So I have to imagine there are some very difficult decisions uh, that the Bengals are going to have to make internally that Joe Burrow, who is the ultimate gamer, is going to try and figure out himself. If they feel an extra week of rest, even if you think – you have a chance to go 0-3. Look, you have to do what's right for him and what's right for the franchise going forward. So it'll be a fascinating situation to watch unfold the deeper we get into the Week 3 schedule. But before we get to Week 3, still a pair of games to get to for Week 2. Uh, and we'll start with the early game on the Monday night schedule, which will take us to Charlotte, where the Carolina Panthers will play host to a division rival. This number has been on the move from where it opened. New Orleans was a two and a half point favorite early in the week. We're now trending towards that 3.2, 3.3 range with three minus 20, kind of the prevailing price tag. Total down a touch as well from where it opened, 40 and a half, 41, now down to 39. And Billy, it'll be the Panthers making their first Monday Night Football appearance since 2018, a game that all Panthers fans remember fondly. Of course, they did lose 12 to 9 to the Saints in week 15. When we look at the Panthers, they've made a total a total of one appearance on either Sunday or Monday Night Football going back to 2017. However, they do get Derek Carr, who has struggled and struggled mightily when you look at road pr- primetime games in his career, just 1-8 and eight straight up, 2-6-1 and one ATS. As far as the recent history between these familiar foes, the under has gone a perfect 5-4-5. Five, five. Rather than dive into both sides of the ball in this matchup, because I want to spend a little bit more time uh, on the Browns' road trip to... Pittsburgh to take on the Steelers Bryce Young rookie quarterback obviously was going to be up against it and some of these numbers don't lie with the pressure being placed on offensive coordinator Thomas Brown to devise a game plan for his young quarterback when you look at the number one overall quarterback they've lost their second career start in each of the last five attempts the last win came back in 2015 from Jameis Winston um 
I'm not counting Anthony Richardson because he's matched up against a rookie yesterday <laughs> and CJ Stroud and wasn't able yep. to finish that game. Uh, when you look since 1970, number one overall quarterbacks uh, are four and 19 in their second career NFL start. Young's loss in week one meant that the last 15 number one overall quarterbacks just 0 14 and one in their first career start. It was David Carr way back in 2002. But look, it doesn't all fall on Bryce Young. I mean, he was pressured on an inordinate amount of dropbacks versus a Falcons team that's not exactly known for their high pressure rate and when he was facing pressure Bryce Young struggled as you you'd figure any inexperienced quarterback would do so when I look at Carolina's path to success here if it comes in Bryce Young's second career start do you see one have there were there things that jumped out on tape or how do you begin going about handicapping the Carolina offense against this Saints defense yeah I think the whole thing starts with the offensive line that's where we're going to start with this one is they just continue to get hampered by injuries. They're already down uh, right guard Austin Corbett, who's been on IR. They lose their other starting left guard, Brady Christensen, with a t- torn bicep in week one. And that leaves us with a rookie, Chandler Savala, fourth rounder out of NC State, and second year man, Cade Mays, manning the guard positions. The offensive line finished 28th in run block win rate last week. And the thing with drafting, Number one and getting a quarterback is you usually don't have the most talent on your team. And the pro football focus graded them out the 32nd rated pass offense in week one. And when you watch the game, it makes sense. They just, we spoke about it before. We spoke about it on Thursday. They don't have the explosive weapons. They do get DJ Chark back. They got to get LaVisca Chenault in space. He's excellent when he has the ball in his hands, but you got to get him the ball. Bryce... If, if your offensive line can't pass pro, you're going to struggle no matter what quarterback you are. The Jesse Bates interceptions, he didn't even see him, And he threw at least two more interceptable balls in the first half. He now goes a, up against some veteran safeties in Tyron Matthew and Marcus May. Which, in the Tennessee game, we saw Tennessee, you know, Ryan Tannehill had maybe one of his worst games of his career. He definitely missed some opportunities. But it did feel like that pocket was collapsing, and it's tough for me to envision this Carolina offensive line holding up well enough for Bryce to hit some explosive. His longest completion of the day, week one, was 14 yards. Uh, He really targeted Hunter, uh, excuse me, Hayden Hurst. Saints are very familiar with him. He used to play for Atlanta. So I I think there's going to be some struggles again. I think we've seen that in both the spread and the total movement. The three's been there, right, Todd? So when you have a game like this and the three's out there for the home dog, it's been there all week, no one's running to grab it. I think there's an anticipation for maybe three and a half here, and then we'd see some market influencers get involved, but the total drop into 39 and a half, I don't see a ton of Carolina success here. Yeah, I mean, if you've waited out this long and you do have an appetite for the home underdog, no reason to jump in uh, at plus three minus oh five at some of the sharper shops Uh, i do see a couple of plus three at even money there will be an opportunity at least i would anticipate to your point to be able to grab the three and a half public uh you have to think will come in on the road favorite here they're not going to be anxiously looking to try and back Bryce Young in this spot against the Saints defense that should have some success being able to disrupt. Maybe Carolina benefits if DJ Char can log a full workload tonight. I mean, he gives them a little bit more of a deep threat. But to your point, it's exactly spot on when you look at this Carolina offense and you go through some of the skill position players that they have in their mix. I don't think any defensive coordinator is kept up at night trying to game plan for Miles Sanders, Adam Thielen, you know, Marshall or Mingo uh, in the receiving core by any stretch of the imagination. Imagination, so you can understand exactly what Bryce Young will have to deal with until they start to surround him with some weapons. And in the division, even for a team that plays on turf, going outside to play on grass, uh, I'm not anticipating a ton of interest in that home underdog. However, a home underdog that is catching a little bit of buzz would be in the nightcap. And that's with the Pittsburgh Steelers playing host to the Cleveland Browns. You're looking at Cleveland right now, pretty much a two-point favorite painted across the board. Total in this game down substantially from where it opened in that 42.5, 43 range. Now looking at a 38. 
The Browns are looking for their first 2-0 start to a season since 1993. It's the longest such drought in NFL history. Meanwhile, the Steelers suffered a 23-point defeat at home in Week 1 to the 49ers, as we know all too well around here. It was the third largest home loss in the last 30 years and the biggest one for the Steelers since 2006. When you look at Tomlin's teams, though, they have shown resilience in the past. That They've responded to blowouts. They've gone 4-0 in the game directly following the last four times they lost by 20 or more points, all since the 2021 season. Obviously, if you love defense, you're going to really appreciate the two talents that are on display on opposite sides of the ball. Miles Garrett, of course, being the one-man wrecking crew for that Browns defensive front, and TJ Watt for the Steelers. You dig a little bit deeper into some of the numbers. The Steelers are going to officially be home underdogs, barring some miraculous change in the betting market to the Browns for the first time since 1989. Last year, Billy, teams that faced the 49ers the week prior went 1-15 straight up. In that week following, 3-12-1 ATS. Obviously a smaller sample size, but it speaks to the 49ers' level of physicality, even when you have extra time to prepare. But the Steelers will put one illustrious streak on the line. They have won 20 straight home games on Monday Night Football. It's the longest streak in Monday Night Football history. That, of course, doesn't include the rescheduled game they lost during the COVID year against the Washington Commanders and the Browns not exactly filling people's wallets when you look at how they've performed as road favorites, just two and eight in that role over the last 10 games. When we begin to look at this matchup, and we try and isolate the Steelers' offense against the Browns' defense. I mean, that group was excellent last week, aided by Mother Nature, helping completely squash any semblance of an attack the Bengals wanted to put forth. The Steelers went through a power outage in their own right against the 49ers, and it ain't going to get any easier when you don't have a high-volume receiver in Deontay Johnson, one of your other weapons in Pat Fryermuth, extremely banged up. Do you see a path for success with Pittsburgh offensively against Jim Schwartz's defense? Don't forget, too, George Pickens popped up on that injury report with a hamstring on Saturday. That he did, and he is the golden child as far as Steelers fans are concerned. They couldn't bet enough of his props over the total this (laughs) offseason. Yeah, nothing's more finicky than a hamstring on a wide receiver, so that is going to be something to monitor. And they also don't have Anthony McFarland, little speed guy out of the backfield, change up the pace in the pass game. Here's the thing with this offense, and, you know, they got down 20 to nothing relatively early in that game and of course the game plan kind of goes out the window they finished bottom five in both pass and run epa on offense you obviously expect some sort of bounce back on this end of the of the ball but the task doesn't get any easier going up against this talented cleveland front and the secondary and you know i saw there was a clip circulating online carson palmer was on colin cowherd and colin was asking him about Concerns with Joe Burrow. This was last week. And Carson Palmer actually discussed how good he thinks this defensive line is with the addition of Zedarius Smith and the influx of a defensive coordinator with the pedigree of Schwartz. And that we'd probably more likely to be talking about just how good this D-line is rather than Cincinnati struggles later on in the year. And you can see it. Um, The secondary played in an absolute elite level versus Cincinnati. They're confident slightly cocky group which you want out of your secondary I think Greg Newsom Denzel Ward and Martin Emerson had just played a great game they got in Cincinnati's face and when we look at the type of weapons Pittsburgh brings to the table especially in this game we're going to see probably a lot of Allen Robinson who's not a great separator Kelvin Austin's got a bunch of speed and you brought up Pat Fryermuth. he got popped in the chest pretty good he was a full yep. go in practice Friday and Saturday But you got to wonder if he takes a couple more of those shots, what his effectiveness is going to be. The other thing is Najee Harris has to get going. And he looks slow. He looks plotting. He only had eight total touches versus San Francisco. It seems like every three touches he gets, he's got to run off to the sideline because something is ailing him on his body. (laughs) It's it's a frustrating watch, I'm sure, for Pittsburgh Steelers fans. You know, the offensive line was 31st in run block win rate. 32nd in adjusted line yards and my gut says that there's little to almost no drop off between that San Fran defensive line and Cleveland's the Cleveland finally has the interior uh, defensive line they've been yearning for with Shelby Harris and Delvin Tomlinson these two real big bodies that and legit run stuffers I think the total 
you know, coming all the way down to, to 38 shows that this is going to be an uphill battle for this Pittsburgh offense. I mean, you look at this Pittsburgh offensive line, and it appears all signs point to the 14th overall pick, Broderick Jones, getting his first start uh, with Chukes Okafor in concussion protocol. But look, Dan Moore. Have fun. Who, yeah, Dan Moore, who played with Miles Garrett at Texas A&M, wasn't exactly uh, – stout in his season debut either I mean this was a guy that had a, one of the lowest grades amongst any tackle in the NFL left or right during week one and to your point in steps is Brown's defensive front that's been retooled there are some other difference makers that have been added and when you have guys that are extremely comfortable covering on the corner knowing that they don't have to be out there in pass coverage for five to seven seconds that job gets a little bit easier uh, I will say you mentioned Najee Harris it'll be interesting if they get him involved more as a receiver this week uh, in terms of his inability to get to the line of scrimmage and get to that second level as a runner because as we know the best way to slow down a ferocious pass rush is to use that screen game some do it in known passing situations and at least force the Browns to second guess rather than putting Kenny Pickett behind the down and distance in those third intermediates where he becomes a sitting duck back there. On the other side of the ball, when you look at this Browns offense matched up against the Steelers defense, I mean, Deshaun Watson was sacked seven times the last meeting with the Steelers. It tied his career high. Hasn't had a 300-yard passing game since returning from suspension last year with six games left, but he did run five times for 45 yards in week one. So it was good to see him incorporate that element that we know was so dangerous for opposing defenses to contend with when he was operating at his prime. Uh, And he was also coming off his first game as a Brown with a passing touchdown and a rushing touchdown. This is a Steelers defense, loses one of their most impactful players in Cam Hayward, an elite run stopper, an elite guy to try and get after opposing quarterbacks. So when you look at Cleveland's path for success offensively, how do the Pittsburgh Steelers go about trying to slow down one or multiple weapons, given that there is one very interesting number as as it pertains to the Steelers bottling up Nick Chubb? Let's start with Hayward, because I think that's a pretty big injury. Um, The splits with him off the field are not great. I believe Pittsburgh allows just over five yards per carry with him not out there. He has been a Brown wrecker. He's had five sacks the last four games against the Browns. The one thing I'll say about Pittsburgh's defensive line, though, and this was something I was monitoring in the offseason, was they seem to have decent depth on the interior with... Isaiah Loudermilk, they already have Larry Ogunjobi, Montrevious Adams. They kept seven on the defensive line. That's how good and confident they were in their D-line. They just did not want to let those guys go. But, it, you know, there's a difference between a Hall of Fame type player like Cam Hayward and a, and a reserve here. Cleveland loses Jack Conklin. That's a big loss. But Dewan Jones came in, thrown in the fire. He's going to be thrown into the fire against... T.J. Watt, and I have a lot of faith in this Bill Callahan, Scott Peters offensive line coaching staff. I think they're one of the best in the league. Jones was great last week. He had no pressures. They finished third in pass block win rate, sixth in overall pressure rate. I'm more concerned with the other side and the other tackle. Jedrick Willis Jr., he's been terrible. Um, he allowed Terrible might pressure. be an understatement. You may actually be nice to Jedrick just by calling <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> I mean, a four pressures last week. He's going to see a lot of Alex Highsmith tonight. Maybe some Her- Herbig as well, the rookie. That's the that's the side of the line I'm more concerned about when we talk about this matchup here. Again, we've seen the total get hit hit under. I think Pittsburgh's going to have a better defensive outing. It's also tough to gauge Cleveland's offensive performance, you know, in a game with as much rain as they experienced for Cincinnati. Obviously, the run game got going. I think people overlook Nick Chubb a little bit. I think they think of him as just a thumper, but he's a he's got a great ability to, to read a defense, anticipate which holes roll open, make the cut. I think we're going to see them test that interior Pittsburgh defensive line without Cam Hayward in the run game. The other thing is we saw San Fran attack the middle of the field in the past game. Obviously, Amari Cooper looks like he's not playing. He injured his groin in practice on Saturday. That's a big loss to the offense. He's a favorite of Deshaun Watson. He's kind of his safety net. He trusts him to be where he's going to be. It could be a big David and Joku game, Um, as well as Elijah Moore. They've been lining him up everywhere. He's kind of a gadget wide receiver role. And we'll see Cedric Tillman thrown out there as well. I wonder, too, if 
We're going to see a little bit more play action rollouts for Watson. He missed Godwin twice last week. There could have been two touchdowns. If there was better weather, Godwin's probably got two touchdowns last week off of those play action rollouts. So the big question for me is, can Jedrick Willis hold up? And how much will Cleveland test that interior run defense of Pittsburgh without Cam Hayward? I mean, look, some of the numbers don't lie, and it's not an overly complex handicap uh, when you look at the historicals here. Since Nick Chubb entered the league in 2018, the Steelers are 5-0-1 against the Browns when they hold Nick Chubb under 80 yards, and they're 0-3 when he racks up more than 80 yards. You know he's going to get his touches. Chubb flashed as not only a runner but a receiver last year week uh, in their season opener. It was one of the things the Browns had said throughout the preseason. There was no Kareem Hunt to take carries away. There was the potential for Nick Chubb to become more of a true three down back than what we had seen early on in his career when he wasn't much of a receiver. Uh, But it's interesting. You mentioned a lot of the names that I think prop betters are going to focus on for Cleveland, trying to figure out who becomes the beneficiary if Amari Cooper is ruled out. And no reason to believe that with that groin injury that pops up on Saturday, as Deepak mentioned a little bit earlier in the show, that he He's going to be active. Cleveland can err on the side of caution at least a bit, a little bit, knowing that they have other weapons that are more than capable of stepping into that particular role. When you look at this game, uh, I mean, I know we talked a little bit about the total. We've seen it get bet down, both full game and first half, uh, from what I've been told, pretty sharp. Have you seen anything in the prop market that caught your eye or anything that's uh, mildly intriguing to you, being a man who loves to dive into prop bets as much as anything else? <laughs> Nothing yet in the prop market. Some of the guys I mentioned, I am going to be looking at some reception props for him. Elijah Moore is one of them. J- David Njoku is another. You know, the market is kind of telling a story here. We saw Cleveland get steamed out Monday morning. Uh, not this Monday, last Monday. A group came in and laid one. And Pitt now kind of fits that uh, Stanford Wong teaser, The you know, the plus two up through the plus eight. The only thing holding me back from using them in his teaser leg is I'm really concerned about the coaching mismatch here. And when one side has the talent and the coaching, which is this defense for Jim Schwartz against, you know, whatever Matt Canada calls himself, whatever he's trying to run (laughs) over there, he can call himself an offensive coordinator. That's being generous because what we've seen, and you listen to Pittsburgh Steelers fans, they're about done with the guy. But the talent and the coaching edge is is on the Cleveland side here, especially on the defensive side of the ball. It's just keeping me off from using Pittsburgh in a teaser, even though the number it's a it's a little high for me. I would I would lean Pittsburgh here, uh, especially you know T.J. Watson, T.J. Watt. When T.J. Watt plays football for the Pittsburgh Steelers, this defense shows up. But I think this Cleveland defense is something special. I really do. I love this defensive line. And I just can't, I can't get to the window with Pittsburgh. So I think we're going to see them try Chubb early. But ultimately, I like Elijah Moore quite a bit. We went over his receptions in week one. And that is something that I would consider looking at week two, though. Full disclosure, we haven't placed a prop bet for this game yet. Look, Elijah Moore probably has a new lease on life, not just getting out of New York, but I have to imagine on some level he didn't want to live through the Zach Wilson experience for a second season. (laughs) Lucky guy, man. Lucky guy. Given that he became the forgotten man in all things New York Jets vertical passing game uh, with Wilson at the helm there. Uh, You mentioned that teaser, and I saw plenty of sharp guys uh, that I talked to coming in yesterday tying the New England Patriots as the first leg into the Steelers today. Now they'll have a myriad of options should they want to play a middle, keep their position, or figure out exactly what they want to try and do with it. But a uh, fascinating game. Clearly, the Steelers didn't expect to be here. And you mentioned Matt Canada. I joke with my brother-in-law, who is a diehard Steelers fan. I said, be careful what you wish for. That winning streak that kept Mike Tomlin's career record over 500 intact last year allowed Matt Canada a new lease on life. And you may have to suffer through this offensive display for yet another season. And I think Steelers fans hoping for a little bit more than what they saw in the opener against the San Francisco 49ers. All right, my friend, you have done an admirable and excellent job filling in uh, for Payne on Thursday and Monday. Can't thank you enough for pinch hitting uh, while Payne spent a little bit of time with his family, like I said. All expectations and signs point to him being back in the fold Wednesday uh, with Brad Powers as we break down arguably the best college football slate of the campaign. And I know listeners can't wait to hear what Payne's got to say about his beloved Florida State Seminoles road trip to Death Valley to take on Clemson. Any final words of wisdom, parting shots? 
shots, things you'd like to share with our loyal listeners, Billy, who I know will be interested and excited to see you get back in the mix with your columns uh, that perform exceptionally well on the website. Yeah, start the columns back up this week. Uh, appreciate you guys having me on. It was a great opportunity, great experience to see what you guys go through behind the scenes. But I, I too, am very, very uh, ready for Mr. Payne to come back, man. I love hearing him on the pod. He's great, and he can take over the workload. Holy cow. The hey, fact, look. I, I'm so impressed with the, with the stuff that goes into the podcast on the podcast side. I've always tried to just... I love to stay under the radar, do my job, <laughs> make my bets, you know, Mr. Anonymous. It was good to come out here and see what you guys do, though. Really impressive stuff. Hey, it's one of those things that people just want to know what the sausage tastes like. They don't want to know how it's made. Unfortunately, the NFL results haven't been uh, up to our high standards, and we're not here to sugarcoat it, at least through the first two weeks. But it's a marathon, not a sprint. Uh there is no doubt and there is a ton of actionable information that hopefully folks were able to profit from so can't thank you enough Billy uh, for filling in the door will always be open and trust me later in the season uh, there is no doubt in my mind we will get you back into the fold Mr. Anonymous no more uh, with the tremendous job you've done filling in for pain for the last two shows again you can follow Billy on Twitter that's at Watt underscore 05 I'm Todd Furman you can follow me there you can also follow pain uh, at pain insider I guess it's X which I'll start calling it going forward instead of Twitter and as always the podcast at bet the board pod best of luck with whatever wagers you choose to make on a pair of Monday night football games between the Carolina Panthers New Orleans Saints Pittsburgh Steelers and Cleveland Browns and hopefully we'll see you at the window we hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of bet the board make sure you follow Todd and Payne on X Todd is at Todd Furman. That's T O D D F U H R M A N. And Payne is at Payne Insider. That's P A Y N E I N S I D E R. Don't forget, our weekly newsletter comes with an additional best bet. Have that delivered to your inbox by clicking the link atop the podcast show notes. And most importantly, subscribe and download Bet the Board. We're on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Wondery, YouTube, Google Podcasts, and all your other major platforms.